my gun, Jin. Okay, so I'm here with uh, Jeremy Lalonde, uh, who is the writer, director of uh, many, uh, well, quite a few uh, films. Uh, my favorite of which being uh, How to Plan an Orgy in a Small Town. <laughs> um, but uh, is also a, a author of the latest film, The Go-Getters. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk to you, sort of uh, pick your brain about indie films, since this channel is um, very much about folks trying their hand at their first feature film. Yeah. Um, and so can you set us up with a little bit of history though? Like how did you come to indie film? So how did I get into it? Um, lack of other skills and just, uh, and a lifelong desire to tell stories. And, and that was the medium that spoke to me the strongest, I think. And I think that's probably similar to a lot of other people. And then, uh, you know, despite being a, a cis white male, I still had no, you know, opportunities to uh, to make my own, to have just someone hand me a project or hand me money to make a, a film. So I was like pretty much everyone else, where I just had to grind and struggle and and do my own shit for the longest time. Uh, and I, but I did get lucky. You know, I, I did definitely get lucky in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I made a ton of shorts, like most people do when they're starting out. And uh, luckily, I'm from Canada, or I'm in Canada. I'm not only from Canada, I'm currently in it. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm married, so I'm not accepting uh, proposals to get your green card over here. I, I apologize. Um, but uh, luckily, we have and have had, we don't have as many anymore because our government is slowly becoming a slight bit more like yours in uh, not necessarily our, our prime minister and the cabinet, but more local politics um, where we have a few less funding agencies that help support filmmakers. But we used to have this amazing thing called Bravo Fact, which was a place where you could get, you know, a really significant amount of money to make short films. Uh, and I'm talking like tens of thousands of dollars to make shorts, which wow. is as you can imagine, is amazing, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, when uh, when we were talking about making a feature on a thousand dollars, I uh, I had this feature that I had written that I knew that I was going to make uh, documentary style because I knew it was my first film called The Untitled Work of Paul Shepard, which is available on iTunes and VODs and other things. Um, and I, I wrote that specifically for something I could do for cheap. I was the the British office had just come out and i that show just really really kind of blew me away and how emotionally effective it was with also being funny and full of heart and and just looking at it going you know the production value in this is not amazing like this is something that i could do yeah it's yeah. almost mumblecore in in sort of the thing if it wasn't for the fact that it's heavily scripted but it looks yeah. like almost Mumblecore and stuff like that, but it's is uh, I think both it and the American version are ahead of their time. Well, that's just it. Like both, and the American version was just starting up around the same time. So it's like those two shows just made me go, oh shit! Like this, they really, really spoke to me in a way that it was like I can tell this story in this way. And you know, I, I put my own stamp on it. Obviously, I didn't just lift their visuals, but just the way it was able to emotionally connect was really, really effective for me, and that really inspired me to write. Um, this, you know, mockumentary uh, rom-com that was my first feature film. And, um, but still, it was the kind of thing where it's like, even when I found a producer that loved the script and wanted to help make it, you know, we were looking at it going, you know, to do this properly, to pay people a little bit, to pay ourselves a little bit, we still wanted to make it for a hundred grand, which is, you know, I think about that now. I'm like, what the fuck was I thinking? Like, I would never advise anyone out starting out to try to raise a hundred thousand dollars for their first indie feature unless they've got the means to do so, because that's just that's a Herculean task. You're right, it's a lot of money. That's a lot of fucking money, man. Um, and but we didn't know any better, and <laughs> we got lucky. So we had um, one thing we did that was very smart was we made a, we decided to make a short film. 
of the same tone and style. And so we got one of these Bravo facts that I mentioned and, and made something that turned out really, really well, played a lot of festivals. And we used that and we were able, my producing, my producer on that film, Anthony Granny, um, knew some people that connected us to this um, post-production company that was looking to get into production. And so they were looking for a very small project that they would personally invest in uh, that could be done well, just to show that they could produce content. And so we walked in with the script, which at that point, we I was a quarter finalist at Nichols with that script. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was doing well. I had this short under my belt and um, and went in with a with a, a plan and, and we said, look, the reason why most indie films are bad and don't do well are these following reasons. And one of the like, production design is shit. Um, you know, act, actors are bad and you know don't give good, believable performances. The script is bad. All these kind of things, and explain how we are going to avoid all those trappings. And so we convinced them with that, and then gave them the script. And then they came back to us and they said that. If we could get, um, they gave us, we, they asked who we thought we could cast in this movie, knowing that it would be all Canadian. Um, and we've also got this, this great program that still exists inside of Toronto, Canada anyway, called the TIP uh, program, which works with our, our acting agency, which is ACTRA. You guys have SAG, but we have something called ACTRA. Mm -hmm. So they allow you to use full members for like a very, very small fee. Um, so you can get a access to an amazing acting pool. Uh, it's a bit of a rigmarole and a process to apply and go through it and get it, but but it's you know they don't really turn people down. They just they just put you through hell to try to get you to make sure you're not going to take advantage of them and and all that kind of stuff. And so we we put together a list of you know Canadian actors that were on TV series or had a little bit of notoriety that we thought we could potentially get. And so we had you know, a list of 100 actors for various roles. And they came back to us and they said, if you can get three actors on this list to do the movie, we'll give you $100,000 to help make the movie. And so we got five of the actors. Wow. So we came back and they had, at that point, they had no choice but to, but to do it. And the well, next said we do this. Yeah, and the great thing was because they're a post-production company is all of our post-production costs were, were going to be covered. Uh, we didn't pay a penny for post production. All we had, all we needed to do was cover production costs for that movie. And so, in the end, we, Anthony and I were really, really adamant that we would a not go over budget, but we actually came in at ninety thousand dollars. And we, which we then said, can we reserve this and use this for marketing or festivals or whatever? Like, let's assume that this money is not is still useful for us potentially, but we didn't go overboard during production so i feel like that's like uh sort of the peril of indie film like you you do all this uh stuff and you raise all this money and then i feel i see all these people like spend all their money in production and then they don't leave anything for like post or yeah. marketing or things like that and you just can't work like that um even mark duplass who um uh, sort of inspired this idea in the first place. Even he doesn't sort of um, advocate for spending the entire like thousand dollars that you're going to spend in making this movie on on the movie. Like he's, he's saying, you know, leave it uh, some things left over for festivals. And festivals can be expensive. Like you can spend a thousand dollars just on entry fees. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Easily. we did that on my first film. We spent like. I think we uh, tried to enter 30 festivals and spent very close to $3,000. Yeah, um, yeah. Just trying to, like, just own festival fees and things like that. Yeah. You get in, you got to travel. Right, right, right. You know, and festivals um, do not, most of the time, like, festivals do not put you up. Oh, no, they put you up. Often festivals will give you a hotel room for a night or two, but they won't travel you in. No. Uh, if you were very lucky, I, for the first, I, it wasn't until I made my third feature film that I got flown to a festival. And I, and I didn't even know they were doing that. They just gave me uh, a check when I got there to reimburse my fees, and it blew my mind. <laughs> so what, the, what do I do with this? This is amazing. Uh, I mean, if you're like, usually they'll put you up, 
they give you a hotel room for a night or two, or you can beg and borrow and try to get. You know, here's a here's a good trick for festivals. If you're going, let them know you're going and ask if there's any like events and panels or anything like that that you can help them be part of. Because when you do that, you can often get them to feed you, and or just like give you other kind of perks. Yeah, like a meal voucher or something like meal that. Meal voucher, whatever. Like those kind of things are, are great. Or or at least the program will take you out for dinner. And that kind of stuff, because it's like every dollar counts towards your travel fees. I mean, it's all right. You can write it all off in your taxes, but there's little things you can do to just kind of maximize your own personal spending when you're traveling to these things and bring snacks. Yeah. It's, have a snack, snacks are always important. Well, also, a lot of times there's like filmmakers lounge at fest- festivals and they have like, you know, granola bars or fruit and stuff just sitting around. Put them in your bag, man. They're just yeah. either either just during the day because sometimes you don't have time. You're running from film to film or this to that, and you literally don't have time to stop. Um, yeah, so good to give you either a quick boost between meals or snacks, and but it's also free shit. Yeah, just toss it. In. I was thinking about that. Just like bring a backpack and toss it in a bag, and just like you know, just that stuff. You got uh, things to grab and go. Now, um, you've worked. Le, uh, at pretty much every budgetary level, um, I would well, think. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like indie filmmaking, I right. like so it's like yeah, my first film I made for I got very lucky. I made it for uh, you know, let's say a hundred thousand dollars, and then my second, and then but that film did not light the world on fire. You know, it didn't uh, it didn't do all the things that you hope as an indie filmmaker, where you're like, man, I make a movie, and then I'm going to become the next Kevin Smith or Tarantino or one of those guys. Right. That is, happened for me out of the gate and you know i it still has not happened for me uh but i continue on and then so after that i uh i crowdfunded my second film sex after kids we raised sixty five thousand dollars in crowdfunding which i've also seen and also enjoy i really enjoy that film. oh thanks man uh so i'll just burn through the various funding things so so we did that for sixty five thousand uh, it did very, very well. That was the kind of film that really, really put me on the map in terms of like the Canadian filmmaking community and people were starting to pay attention to me. And the film played in a lot of festivals. It actually, we got like an, an international sales agent and it, and it sold in various countries. And for a movie that was made for $65,000, it, it we recouped our money. And the nice thing, because crowdfunding, we didn't owe anybody a penny. So my producer and I actually made some money on that film. Right. Uh, to the point where my wife was just blown away because we kept getting checks and <laughs> and no, but it was great. It was it was shocking to us. But that's only because that film was made for sixty. No, I know that's the thing. Like when you, I had a a, a friend tell me recently he had a, the same sort of thing where it's just like he, you keep getting these checks and you're just like I don't know what to do with myself. Like I, I, I these things are actually making money. Who does? Well, how does this? What? But it's because it was so cheap, you know. So we 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 spread it around to the cast and crew and that kind of stuff. Because the other thing is, when you make these tip films in Toronto, is you owe two point five percent of any of your profits to the actors, so they split that amongst them as well. Nice. Uh, and then so and then, but still, it's like I was still uh, I got lucky. And the third film I made, How to Plan an Origin in a Small Town, uh, I was able to kind of finally strike up a relationship based on sex with their kids with. Uh, Telefilm Canada, who is a major funding body of, of film in Canada, uh, and they were like, you know, what? It, let us know what you're interested in doing next because we'd love to support you. We think you've got a really interesting voice, and so I came to them with how to plan an origin in a small town, and they really, really liked it. And they can, and they, they, they can only come on board for up to 49% of your budget maximum because they're a government agency and they can't own a controlling share of the film. Interesting. So it's on you. So usually you uh, then what you, you do is you find some you either do pre-sales to try to fill the, the other gap. You know, it's usually a combination of private investment, pre-sales um, and tax credits. Uh, luckily, the tax credit system in Canada isn't lottery based the way it is in the States. Uh, it's not like you're hoping you get it. As long as you get a broadcast sale or you took off certain boxes, you get the tax credits here which makes it really, really attractive to make movies here, which is why we have a lot of your runaway production. Yeah. Uh, and now it goes to Georgia, except for they don't care about women's rights. So unfortunately, we well, do. Yeah, they might be shooting themselves in the foot there. Um, so so um, what, if you can tell me at least about production 
despite the budget, you know, whether it's, you know, like you said, $100,000 or $65,000, what are the things about indie film that don't change? Yeah, I mean, here's my question for you with this $1,000 budget. Are you not feeding people? Because that's, how do you, how do you even just, no, seriously, though, like. I know, I know. How do you not just spend that all on food? Well, I mean, uh, it helps that uh, I have sort of an, an in-house chef uh, and, uh, and my son, uh, but we also... Um, but that's the labor. Labor is easy. Well, in a thousand dollar movie, nobody's making, making, getting paid. Right. Is, how do you even just... I mean, food's, not, food's the one thing I always tell people that you can't skimp on when you're making an indie film. No, you can't. And the way that I feel like that, like, you know, just for tips sake and stuff like that, the way to, to feed everybody and to keep your budget low is to make sure that I usually don't have any more than 10 people on set. Yep. Um, like, at all times, at any time. Like, I'm, that's including actors. I'm talking about cast and crew. No more than ten people, because if you start like uh, trying to feed more than ten people at once, especially even over a, a few days, then you're just it, it's it it gets wild. Um, yeah. I learned that on my first film where we went and um, uh, we had I think the most crew. It was like thirty crew members and a bunch of extras, um, like like almost forty extras. And um, we spent fourteen hundred dollars in a day. Like we just spent fourteen hundred dollars trying to feed people. It was like an entire paycheck uh, at that point, and just dropped it right on food. And I learned that the hard way. Well, that's just it. And, and and I mean, another person that when I went, you know, my first film didn't really hit, and I was going to do my second film. We knew we'd probably have less money, which we did. I mean, the order of my budgets went from, you know, 90, 100,000 for the first one. My second one was 65. My third one was the 300,000. And then the one after that I made for 120 or 30 because it was go-getters and it was a very dark script and no one wanted to, <laughs> no one loved it, but no everyone was like, you can't make this movie. So we're like, fuck it, we're going to crowdfund and just do it for whatever we can. And then the movie I just made last year that hasn't come out yet called James vs. Future Self was the first time I made a movie with a budget, it was like a $2 million movie. Um, but but when I was doing Sex with the Kids, it was like, it was another thing where I'm like, it's very similar to this like $1,000 model, even though I had 65, uh, in the sense that I was like, someone who really inspired me at that point was Edward Burns and what he was doing with- With uh, the newlyweds. Newlyweds and then Nice Guy Johnny, I think it was called. Mm. And, and he had, I think his was like a $10,000 model. Yeah. And, uh, and, and just- Listen, and, and for him, it's like he was like shooting on a weekend, shooting two days here, two days there, not going, well, I have to shoot it all in 15 days in a row. And so when I did Sex After Kids, that movie was designed to be, uh, it's, it's, it's um, a bunch of like, it's about five or six different storylines that intercut. Um, and the beauty of being able to do that was I was basically able to shoot out each, each um, group storyline over the course of a weekend or a long weekend, two or three days. And so I didn't need any one actor for more than two or three days. Um, Which saves you on budget and continuity. Yeah, and we shot the movie, I think it was a 15, 16 day shoot that we shot over the course of four months. Just like every other weekend or every weekend, every now and then. And that's just how we did it. And I was able to keep on doing rewrites and editing while I was doing that. Um, But it also made it so that, and what we did for food on that one is we use like a sandwich caterer um, and just basically we just had sandwiches and salads every day. But I'll tell you right now, if we did, if we've had people like that for 15 days in a row, they'd have fucking killed us. Right. But when you split it up over the course of, uh, of a couple of a couple months, it's not so bad. But then we also just, I mean, the other trick I think is like, then, but you've also got to deal with dietary restrictions and something. Right. You know, I have my own thing. Like, I have my own lifestyle that I eat at now. I didn't then. Then you could just feed me fucking anything and I'll eat it. I don't give a shit. Uh, but now I'd be like, well, I need this and I need that. Uh, and you don't, the last thing you can ever, ever do on an indie film is tell people to bring their own food. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's. People with dietary restrictions will bring their own because they're used to not having options. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't, you got to try at least. And so I, I know, I know a lot of tricks that people I know. And the people that I mentor that are, are making these really, really low budget movies, 
is they try to just make a meal that literally everyone can eat. So they try to eat, make stuff that's, you know, vegan, but also not, un, you know, that would not make a carnivore sad. Uh, yeah. So like lots, so Mexican, like a lot of plate, a lot of thing is like one magical food you can make is like a buffet style of a Mexican feast. Because you can have uh, rice, for the people that don't like to eat, like that are gluten free, um, you can have just put and you can have just lettuce, so people can put it on a bed of lettuce. You can have cheese for the people that want to put cheese in. You can have some meat, so people can add meat to it, or just have the beans. Like having a little Mexican buffet that people can make their own bowls or burritos or tacos is like a really great, and that food is cheap as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's a really great tip. I think we did um, on our first movie. I think we did a potato bar, and uh, that's a great, that's similar, yeah. right? And my wife came up with that idea. That was her idea, and I was like, "Really, a potato bar?" And it was the head of the set. It was the the whole set. We had a bunch of meals, but that potato bar, people just talked about it and talked about it because it was just food. everybody just came and ate from the potato. Like I said, we had a bunch of mixed, you know, kind of appetites. Um, you know, vegan and not vegan and, and like stuff like that. But everybody came to the table for the potato bar, man. They just loved it. That's just it because you can add this and that. You can take stuff away. You can have right. sweet potato. You can mm -hmm. have russet potatoes. That's a brilliant idea. I yeah. So. Right. Yeah, and those are the tricks, you know. Mm -hmm. and, just, and then try to have snack foods that are high energy that aren't just sugar because people will crash. You know, especially young people that are helping on film sets. They just see like a a ta table full of candy and sugar and they fucking go crazy. <laughs> no, they do. And then, and then they're used. No, I know, I do. Uh, so anyway, but he's like, sorry, we're talking about food. But that's, I mean, food is a, a crucial key to your success as a filmmaker. You can make people work late. You can make people work in the cold under like not great conditions always. But man, if they're hungry and you're doing that, you're screwed. That's when you get mutiny. Yeah. Yeah, you love it, Qui-Gon Jinn.